Okay, I think we're ready to start. So hello and welcome. Um, I'm Vicky Wetherington and I manage creative papers and specification within Antalus UK. I will be your host for this webinar. Today I have two special guests with me, Xavier Jouvet, who is Director of Papers and Visual Comet Antalis, and Ruben de la Rive Box, who is the Founder and Director of Design and Practice, the agency who has been working with Antalis on the relaunch of its new creative papers. So Xavier, let's start with you. Six months ago, when Arjo Wiggins sadly went into administration, Antalis made the decision to acquire all the Arjo Wiggins creative paper brands. Was it a difficult decision to make? Well, actually, uh, yes and no. Uh, no, because we knew these were iconic brands. And yes, actually, for exactly the same reason, uh, buying iconic brands was putting a lot of pressure on us, uh, given the reputation of these brands and uh, the level of expectations uh, that Arjo begins uh, customers uh, uh, add. So uh, from the start, we made a, a strong commitment uh, to match the uh, original Arjo Begins quality without any compromise. And the second one was that we would continue to introduce new and exciting innovations in the future. Ruben, um, from a communication standpoint, the Antalis Creative Power Initiative has evolved to become Creative Power by Antalis. Is that a reflection on this evolution from being a distributor of these brands to becoming the owner of one of the most iconic portfolios? Hi, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that the end of Arjo Wiggins was a, a huge loss for the industry. Um, but when Antalus approached us to work on this project, we immediately saw a huge potential for creative power to develop. Um, Creative Power has been this platform uh, built that was being built by Antalus as a tool to support the creative community. Um, and we have been involved with it before already. So um, with this new development, we saw it um, being much bigger, much stronger, um, and a comprehensive collection of, of these brands that bring together product, services, and community. Um, and I think that's quite unique for the industry. Um, so we basically, because we worked on the Olin rebranding and repositioning uh, a few years before, we used the strategic thinking that we did for Olin and we built it out into a framework um, so that creative power um, would on the one hand uh, show the ownership of Antalis and on the other hand really build out in its own strong brand. So that's why we made it Creative Power by Antalus. Um, and then in terms of branding for the individual paper ranges, we felt it was necessary to give them each their own voice. Um, under Arjo Wiggins, they had all been part of the Arjo Wiggins branding and they were sort of, we felt a little bit hard to distinguish, distinguish between each other. Um, so, to various degrees, we redesigned uh, a logo and an identity for each brand, but then within one overarching design system. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Xavier, you um, told us a bit earlier that um, you took on the exciting challenge of redeveloping these brands. Um, could you explain the steps you've been through? Absolutely, so to, to share a bit what has happened behind the scene after uh, Arjo, unfortunately, went into administration. The, the first step was first to negotiate with the administrator to buy the brand. So it took us uh, about a month. Uh, but obviously, we also want to have enough stock so that we had time to make the transition. So we bought something like 4,000 tons uh, of products, uh, about six months worth of sales. Uh, so that we knew from the start that we had uh, six months to make the transition, which is very short. Uh, such a transition normally should take 12 months. Uh, there are so many things to do. So it was a big challenge, but uh, at the end, uh, we decided to, to, to go for it. Um, so that was the first step. Oh, thank you. So, so um, how did you select the suppliers for each brand? Now, this was obviously the first uh, decision we had to make. So we... Uh, um, you know, we had the brands, we had the, also the, all the inter intellectual property associated with the brand. So the recipes, the ingredients, uh, 
the original samples, the technical data sheets. So we had everything. But, you know, making paper is a bit like uh, cooking. Uh, you know, you, you can have all the ingredients and the recipe, but at the end, you're not sure about the result if you don't have the know-how and the, the right cook. So uh, from the start, we, we decided to uh, hire uh, two former employees from uh, Arjo Vigin, so the former uh, general manager from Arjo Vigin, Scotland, and his technical director, who are really the experts in making uh, the Arjo brand. So we hired them uh, with them uh, and with my uh, um, expert uh, at Antalis, uh, Jérôme Noyel. Uh, we did visit six or seven mills in Europe that we knew could help in designing uh, this or redeveloping these new brands. Uh, and we, we did a lot of work with them. We assessed their technical capabilities, uh, what kind of equipment they had, what kind of grades they were doing. Uh, and then we, we made a, our decision uh, to, to, for each brand on which meal we would produce uh, uh, these new redeveloped brands. Okay, so, so was the decision made um, on technical aspects alone? Well, obviously, not only on technical aspect, but the, the, the main criteria was definitely the capability to reproduce uh, uh, and to match uh, as much as possible the historical uh, brands from Arjo. Uh, we could have taken off the shelf products and rebatch them. That's not what we want to do. We really wanted to uh, replicate the brands. So there were some other criteria, like, uh, of course, uh, the long term uh, financial stability of the suppliers, their ability in terms of logistics uh, so that we can offer a, a good service and also uh, how they could uh, more long term uh, be a support with uh, innovation. So these were also uh, very uh, important uh, uh, criteria. Okay, so so um, what was the most difficult brands to make? Well, um, f first of all, it, it took us about six months to fine tune all the products. Uh, so basically, until now, and we are right in the middle of the transition. We're starting to run short of the old products, uh, and we are introducing the new ones. Um, it was a complex process. We did a lot of testing. Uh, when you, you want to replicate the product, not only you need to have the look and feel uh, of, the, of the paper you would try to, to, to replicate, but you also need to ensure we have a good printability. So it was not just about, you know, texture, color matching and so on. Uh, we did also a, a lot of real test printing. So that's why it took, uh, it took us six months. Uh, we worked with uh, our experts, uh, with uh, Arjo Vigin consultant support, but also with the paper mill experts. And I must say that I've been impressed by the professionalism and the level of expertise from uh, all the, the people we have met in these mills. And we really work as a, as a team. So to, to come back to, to your point about the most difficult uh, product or brand to make, uh, I have a little testimonial from uh, Angus Maxwin, who is a former uh, general manager from uh, Arjo Vigin. Hi, my name is Angus Maxwin. I've been with Arjo for 40 plus years in both engineering and manufacturing. So there's nobody who knows and understands the products better than I, than I do. Well, Antalus approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in helping them move these products to other mills. So we need now to ensure that these grades and brands are transferred to, to new mills and keep the continuity and keep the quality. Conqueror is especially difficult because it's such a high prestige product and we need to establish the um, methods to make sure that the product is exactly the same. So Conqueror was definitely uh, one of the most difficult uh, product to, to replicate. First of all, you know, uh, Conqueror is the, uh, the flagship brand from Marjo historically. It's a well-known brand uh, around the world. It's probably the most well-known brand, actually, a paper brand in the world. Um, it stands for its unique touch and feel, which is uh, coming from its unique recipe using cotton and some special uh, um, uh, special ingredients in the in the recipe, uh, like potato starch. Uh, it's also uh, very well known for its exceptional and second to none printability. 
Uh, and also, uh, it's very well known for its uh, a unique uh, watermark. So just for the watermark, uh, we had to buy uh, some new dandy roll that we actually bought from the uh, original supplier from Arjo to make sure we had exactly uh, uh, the, the, right, uh, the right logo. But having the, the roll is not enough uh, in the terms of process. You need to ensure that there is some consistency. In the first test, for instance, the Conqueror uh, watermark would uh, slightly fade uh, after a few tons of production. So we had to adjust the process. And also the, the, the positioning of the watermark on the, on, the, on the sheet of paper is also very precise. Uh, Arjo used to a very uh, stringent uh, specification on this. So that was a, a real challenge uh, to make it uh, happen. So Ruben, um, talking about Concra, um, please could you tell us a bit about the work that you've done on its repositioning? Yeah, sure. So, um, so as I said earlier, we evaluated all the brands that were brought into uh, Creative Power by Antales. And we, we, so we, we looked for each brand how to reposition, what to keep and, um, and what to renew. And actually on Concur, we decided to be as light touch as we could, um, because we we know and we feel the history and the heritage of the brand, but also uh, the amount of people that um, that have used it and have loved it for for many years. Um, so we decided to almost keep the word mark as it was. Um, we tweaked a few details. Um, we kept the sword, we kept the year of origin, uh, because for us, these were really important symbols that people um, really recognize. Um, and so for us, this heritage was actually the starting point uh, to really emphasize the long track record of supreme quality um, that Xavier just hinted to. Um, we also decided to keep the idea of landscape photography that Conquer is famous for. Um, and of course, it was the Scottish Highlands before, but we, um, we tweaked it a little bit to show that Conquer is in this new exciting environment. Um, and for us, the vast beauty of these, you know, these massive rocky landscape with snow on it, um, it just perfectly captures the wide variety of texture and also the tones of white. Thank you. So, so whilst I have you, um, can we talk about key colour? Yeah, sure. So um, a very different paper, and uh, I think also equally or almost equally well known. It's one of the most well known uh, ranges for color. Um, so we wanted to really emphasize and focus on color, and especially on the vastness of the collection of key color, the variety between the different colors, um, and the combinations that you can make. And we wanted to show that with key color, um, you can just have a lot of fun as, the, as a designer. Um, there's more subtle colors, there's more outspoken colors, and they combine uh, into really interesting uh, uh, sets as well. So we even actually made a version of the logo um, where it becomes multicolor and it becomes animated, and it really talks about the fun that you can have with color. Okay. So, Xavier, a question for you. Was key color difficult to make? Well, actually, this one was easy uh, because actually the, the main mill which was producing uh, uh, key color continued operation and was bought by a new owner. So we just had to uh, uh, make a, a deal with the new owner uh, to continue production on, on key color and also, by the way, on curious uh, skin and curious matter. So these products have been basically left untouched, but we still had to do... Uh, uh, a range, an assortment review, and also uh, uh, changing the logo, so the wrappers and so on. So it was taking a bit of time, but we, we didn't have to, to work as much on the, on the, the product de development itself. Okay, that's great. So, so talking about Curious, um, I noticed that a dot um, has been added at the end of the Curious logo. Um, why this change, Ruben? Um, yeah, so Curious was, um, it was actually referred to as the Curious Collection um, under Archer Wiggins. And we felt to it was a bit redundant to have a collection within a collection. So we wanted to really focus on Curious. Um, and we also wanted to focus and to bring out the curiosity that's within the word and within the name. Um, so we were playing with the idea of having all the letters being sort of 
in between upper and lower case, so you're never quite sure. Um, and we put a tittle on the eye to, you know, put people on the right or the wrong foot. Um, and so the dot on the eye became a dot after the word, which then becomes a connector to the subranges. Um, so it's so, you know, you have curious by itself, and then you have curious metallics, curious matter, curious translucence, and curious skin. Um, so it became a bit of a graphic tool, actually, to connect the subranges to the main brands. Oh, great. So expanding on, on, on that question, could you tell us um, a little bit more about the visual aspects of the Curious branding? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, people that know Curious papers, they know that it's, they're some of the most amazing papers when it comes to visual effects, um, tactility, um, and they're really something else. So, yeah, we weren't really confident that the specialty of the paper was going to come through by just photographing them or, you know, including them in like videos. So we realized we need to actually digitally convey the feeling that people get when they use this, um, this paper. So we created these visual ASMR-like animations that per range capture the intent and the feeling and the tactility um, without having the paper in your hands. Great, that's a great tool. So, so Xavier, um, were there any particular challenges around replicating Curious Metallic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was probably technically one of the most difficult uh, products to replicate. Um, you know, actually for many, many years, all Arjo competitors tried to uh, do a product similar to uh, Curious Metallic, but frankly, nobody came close to it. And, and actually, we, we were really lucky when we started looking for a, a sourcing for this product. One of the suppliers had made some good progress uh, to come closer. There was still a gap. So uh, with our help and with the help from uh, the Agile guys I, I mentioned earlier, uh, we were able to, to close the gap uh, and now to have a, a product which is very, very uh, uh, similar. It took us a lot of time. Uh, we had to adjust color by color because some of them were easier to replicate than others. But we, we believe that uh, people will be really pleased uh, with uh, uh, the products we are coming out with, uh, which will show this unique uh, shimmering effect, as uh, some people say, uh, which is very specific to uh, Curious Metallics. Okay. So, Bo, so let's talk about PopSet. Um, here you've made a strong decision to integrate pop set into the Olin family um, as Olin colors. So Xavier, what was the rationale behind this? Well, uh, I must say we have had a lot of discussions internally uh, on whether we should stay with pop set or whether we should move it to the Olin range. Um, from a business point of view, uh, there is always a risk uh, when you drop a, a name like pop set, which had its own uh, awareness uh, to move to a new name. Uh, now, Olin is also very popular, so the risk was probably lower. Uh, and Olin, just to give you a, a feel, we are selling uh, about the same tonnage of Olin that we sell for all the other Arjo brands altogether. So uh, Olin is a strong name. Uh, we had been looking for a color range within Olin for some time. Uh, and finally, when this opportunity came, we decided to, to do it with PopSet because PopSet shares the same smooth uh, surface and all in and uh, we, we thought it was really a, a good fit so uh, but we will continue to communicate on the fact that PopSet has now become all in colors uh, to make sure that the customers uh, don't uh, get lost and, and transition to this uh, to this new quality. Um, so Ruben um, if you could clarify some on the branding yeah, sure. So, of course, we uh, we know Olin really well. We've worked on it a couple of years. So we were very excited to be able to add new sub-ranges and especially color to, to Olin. Um, but also, like, we're also just designers. And I know um, for a lot of designers, they, um, they come to trust certain software or a type foundry that they really love or a paper range that they really love. And then once you become familiar and with with this certain range or company um, you you just want to work with that as much as you can so I think now having a family such as Olin um, that offers 
a really, I think, complete collection of white design papers, but also these really earthy, um, environmentally friendly papers for origins. And then this really big range of colored papers with a similar texture um, is just really exciting. So I think um, Olin has become so much more complete. Um, if you work as a designer on an identity and you're really used to working with Olin, it's just a luxury to also be able to use all these colored papers within it. Great. So, so moving on from there, Ruben, let's talk about Reeves. Could you um, share your thoughts? Yeah, so um, Reeves is really um, known for, you know, the embossings, the textures, the richness, the tactility. Um, it's quite, we see it as quite a classic brand, um, slightly understated um, and really with a focus on the quality of the, yeah, the touch and the tactility. Um, so we wanted to make sure, for this one, we just wanted to really focus in on the product itself and emphasize and almost enlarge the, the, the beauty of these textures. So what we did is we paired to each texture, we paired a glass texture or a textured glass, some with lines, some with like more speckly uh, textures, and we projected uh, light through it onto the paper. So the benefit of this is that on the one hand, we communicate um, what these textures are in a bit of a dramatic way, um, but using the light like this also actually brings out the texture itself within the product. So it really becomes visible and very clear um, uh, what each paper is. That's great. So Xavier, um, are all the textures available in Reeves? Um, they are becoming available this month. Uh, Reeves is the last product we, we worked on you know, in terms of product development. Um, so they will be, become available this month and early June. Um, we had a specific challenge with Reef Tradition because Arjo was using a unique, uh, a unique production process. Uh, the the, the um, specificity about the Reef uh, aspect is that it's uh, a pattern which is at the same time very natural, but also very precise. And it was very difficult to replicate because we could have done it with what's called a felt uh, to get this natural aspect but it would not have been so precise and consistent over time. Same time, we could have used another technique, which is to use a cylinder to uh, mark the paper offline after the paper has been produced. But then we would have something very mechanical and not so much natural. So actually, we decided to go to the original process from Marjo, which is to do a, a, a marking with a cylinder, but during the paper production process online when the paper is still wet. And this is what produces this unique aspect of uh, of Reef Tradition. So we had to order again a, a cylinder with a supplier uh, for this, uh, from the supplier who is uh, providing Arjo in the past. Uh, but it was not enough. The, the process itself has to be fine tuned to exert the right pressure on the cylinder during the marking and, uh, and not also smoothing too much during the calendaring process. So uh, a lot of uh, technical uh, exchanges with uh, the people from the mill and our experts and uh, and to, to come up with a, a solution. So the, this product has been really finalized uh, uh, basically last week. Uh, so we're now entering the, the production cycle. Uh, so it will take a, a few weeks to be available. Okay, so, so finally, Xavier, I can see that a lot of work has been done over the past months. Um, as a conclusion, where do we stand in this exciting journey? Well, we're basically done, as I said, uh, finalizing the product development. Um, so all products now are entering production. We have already started shipping all-in design for at least four or five weeks now. Uh, this was followed afterwards by uh, Conqueror. Already two weeks ago, we started shipping some Conqueror products. Uh, all-in colors, uh, um, you, you may know that to produce all the colors, it takes about two months, uh, two month cycle. Uh, producers start with the white colors and then the shade one, the, the pale ones, and then uh, go up to the dark one at the end of the cycle. So uh, it will take until end of May to have uh, all the colors uh, available. Uh, and I just mentioned also uh, Curious and K color, where we have uh, little changes in terms of production. So this is easy. And finally, when it comes to Reeve, 
uh, as I said, we, we start the production as well right now. So, so we are almost there. Um, again, this uh, change should have probably taken 12 months. So we managed to do it in six months only. Everything is not perfect yet, uh, especially when it comes to the sales tools. We should receive our first uh, sample packs uh, next week for lean design, and then the others will follow. Uh, but obviously, to produce simple packs, you need to be uh, also uh, first produce uh, the, the products in production. So that's why it takes a bit more time. Uh, we have been working also on other sales tools that will come for uh, our customers uh, probably um, early in the summer and until the, uh, September for the most sophisticated tools. Uh, in the meantime, we have also worked a lot on our communication. You may have seen a lot of uh, videos on social media and we'll continue in this uh, in this direction. So uh, overall, very pleased with the results. Now all this uh, has to translate into sales. So we look forward to uh, delivering uh, uh, these new ranges. And uh, we also look forward to get the, the feedback from our customers. I hope they will appreciate uh, all the investment in time and energy uh, that we have put in, uh, in trying to, to meet uh, our first uh, uh, commitment I showed at the presentation, at the beginning of the presentation. So matching the quality, but also introducing some uh, new uh, exciting innovations. Well, it's a bit confidential, but I, I can give you a hint on things we are working on. We are also working on uh, launching a luxury uh, creative uh, paper ranch uh, at Luxpack in June. Uh, it will base, be based on Delos Ranch, which is a very uh, famous ranch, a uh, very famous brand from Arjo. Uh, but there will be also some, some additions. Uh, we are also looking at doing a 100% cotton uh, conqueror for uh, probably uh, September. Uh, we are also looking at... Uh, um, at some products that we, we had to, to, to uh, discontinue. So I'm thinking in particular about uh, K-color particles. Uh, this product never uh, was never uh, uh, been selling very well because it was introduced during the time of COVID and also it was not fitting very well within the K-color range. So we're looking at uh, relaunching it under uh, the Curious range. So a lot of things going on. And I hope uh, you will see this coming out uh, uh, in, the, in the next few months. Yeah, lots and lots happening. So um, amazing. Thank you for sharing what's happening behind the scenes. Um, we have been receiving a lot of questions. So I propose we move to the Q&A session. Um, just for everybody, um, if we're unable to answer all of the questions today, we will respond um, after the, the webinar. Okay, so I don't want to I don't know how you want to move on to the questions. So let, let's pick them uh, one by one. Uh, there is one I, I can answer, which is uh, uh, looking at the various ranges. It seems you have reduced the number of items quite a bit. Can you comment on this? So uh, it's true. Uh, it's a definite choice we have made. We have reduced a bit the number of SKUs uh, to leave room for uh, future introductions. Uh, uh, that the, the first point. The second point is. Uh, let's face it, there is no point having huge ranges if you're not able to deliver them and if you don't have uh, inventory. Uh, it was a bit of an issue in the past with, with Arjo, uh, and we have decided to streamline a bit uh, to uh, focus on the most popular uh, products uh, that our customers are really uh, uh, interested to, to, to get and to leave a bit of room for uh, some additional uh, innovations. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, how many suppliers have you used to fulfill the range and are there any benefits, benefits in doing that? Uh, we, we are using today four suppliers and six different mills. Um, there are some benefits. First of all, I think we would not have been able uh, to uh, uh, to run all these projects in parallel with one supplier only. Uh, I can tell you it's been a lot of uh, work for everyone. Uh, second is we obviously limit our risk by spreading a bit uh, the range across various suppliers. Um, you know, we have seen in the past uh, some uh, suppliers having 
problems, not only uh, financial problems, but also strikes. Last year, we had a big strike in the industry, as probably most of you know. Um, there have been some floods historically, so we, we've seen a lot of things going on. So obviously, splitting a bit uh, the range uh, was also a way to, uh, to reduce the risk. Uh, it's also a way to leverage more suppliers in terms of innovation for the future. So we'll have more uh, suppliers to work with us on, on some new, uh, new ideas we have. Um, and it should also improve uh, the availability of products and also possibly, uh, I'm thinking about the colored range, uh, the possibility to be more reactive on bespoke uh, colors, for instance. So that should be uh, uh, some of the benefits I see into, into this. Uh, maybe there is one, uh, Ruben, you can answer, which was about uh, uh, the most yeah. difficult decision when it came to rebranding these iconic brands. Uh, can, can you comment on this? Yeah, sure. I think um, uh, one, one big challenge was, as you already indicated, the time squeeze. There uh, was a very fast-paced project. There were many brands. There were many decisions to make. So that, of course, um, was quite interesting and challenging. Um, another thing, of course, is we every brand that we design in this project has other designers, other creatives um, in the audience. So it's pretty much the most critical audience uh, that we can ask for. Um, and that also makes it really exciting, of course. Um, but then the, the biggest challenge, I guess, we set ourselves is to bring out the unique quality in each brand individually. And we saw that really as... Um, this is really a moment in time where all these iconic brands transfer into one new collection, um, especially Olin was joined by all these other great brands. And we saw that as a moment where we can really look at each brand individually, see what their strengths are and how can we visualize that really well. And at the same time, create one design system where these brands can all fit um, within one overarching uh, look and feel. Okay, thank you, Ruben. I, I see some very pragmatic uh, question I will try to answer. So about samples, about... Uh, yeah. uh, so as I said, uh, we're almost there regarding the first sample packs. Uh, we have... Um, the best is go to on our websites uh, where we have some forms that you can order the sample packs. This is going live uh, now uh, and we will accelerate our communication on this. Um, there is also a question about, do we still have stock of the old products? Uh, yes, we do still have stock of old products. And I would encourage you to talk to your local Antelis uh, sales rep. And there are some great opportunities as we have uh, obviously uh, made some promotion to, uh, to accelerate the sales of the old products to transition to new ones. Uh, what else do we have? Um, yeah, there are two questions about uh, green. Uh, aspects. So any particular change for the new range in terms of green credentials? And the other one is, do you see an overall trend in terms of need for more environmental responsible products uh, for luxury brands? So I will try to cover both. Um, so what I can say is that on the replacement of the current products by uh, uh, the former Arjo products by the new ones, uh, we have uh, always uh, green credentials which are equal or higher. Uh, actually, some of the products were uh, not produced in uh, in a meal, which was uh, what is the term? Uh, help me. Um, sorry, I, I mixed my and uh, I forgot about FSC the point. certified, perhaps. Or? Uh, no, FSC is definitely the key criteria, and we are always using FSC certification. No, it's a EU label. EU, EU flap, yeah. EU, EU label certification, mm -hmm. which. Is now with uh, most of the meal we have been using. So some of them were not uh, producing EU label uh, uh, certified meals. So this is an improvement. Uh, you know that Antalis has created a system called the uh, Green Star system, which gives a kind of rating between one star to five star on our, on our level of uh, eco responsiveness or eco uh, uh, friendliness. Uh, so most of them now have moved to uh, from three to four stars. Now, when it comes to uh, luxury brands, um, I would differentiate the case of luxury packaging versus uh, 
the case of uh, graphic uh, application. Uh, in, in pure graphical application, uh, there is a trend for more uh, green products, more recycled products, but the quality of printing is so important that uh, the move is, is happening uh, not as fast as in, in luxury packaging. In luxury packaging, there is really a trend for more uh, uh, environmental friendly products. It's overall true for packaging, by the way, not just luxury packaging. Uh, but, you know, uh, green credential can come into various forms. Uh, of course, it can be uh, recycled pulp, but it can be also alternative fibers. It can be uh, the use of waste of other industries, like uh, we have a product called Refit from Favini uh, that we sell, and that is made of waste of cotton and, uh, and wool. So uh, it's quite interesting concept. Um, there are also other aspects, the, the carbon neutrality of some brands like uh, um, Nautilus is interesting. Uh, in our portfolio, we have also uh, uh, the, an approach which is called cradle to cradle, where we try to have a closer loop uh, usage of the uh, from the, the birth of the product to the death, and then recycle, then reuse, and uh, make sure we use uh, the products that have been uh, uh, put in the waste to to, to reproduce uh, new new uh, new paper. So many different initiatives. We also have all in. Uh, origin that was mentioned a bit earlier uh, by uh, Ruben, which is really interesting because it contributes to 1% uh, for the planet, which is an organization which is really uh, investing in projects to protect the planet. So again, when you look at green, there are various uh, different uh, uh, options to, to, to be green. Xavier, I've just, I'm just reading a question um, here. Um, could you just clarify um, what's happening with Popset? Um, if someone's asking, um, is the Popset no longer remaining? Um, could we just, could you just explain what's happening yeah. with Popset again? So Popset will uh, will disappear. Uh, we still have some stock, so we're selling the stock. But the all-in color grade we have developed is very very close to popset if it's, it's the goal was really to to uh, to match popset so i know it's a, a bit of a intellectual exercise to accept the idea that uh, popset is going to go uh, so there will be no longer popset uh, brand in the market uh, in two years time uh, but we hope that all customers will have transition to uh, only color which will be basically the same quality uh, and uh, we will communicate on this transition for at least a year, uh, if even maybe more, if people have still not understood the, the switch. Okay. okay um, and will we um, be producing a sample book um, further down the line um, for, for these creative um, papers? Uh, that's, uh, we have not definitely decided what more advanced tools we will do for, for uh, the rest of the year. Uh, that's a possibility. There are pros and cons on doing a, a full collection. It's true, it's true that it's neat when it's being delivered, but it becomes very quickly obsolete. So uh, uh, we know some of our competitors or some of our uh, suppliers actually uh, have this approach. Uh, that's something we will we, we discuss internally. Uh, I welcome your, your feedback on this. It's it's quite expensive, to be frank. Such an investment means uh, probably uh, uh, between one and two million euro of investment. So just to give you a feel, so we're not talking small money here. So, uh, but uh, that's a possibility. For sure, we will do tools similar to what you have seen with Arjo. There was someone asking about the combination of colors. Uh, if you remember, I think a couple of years ago, we introduced, uh, or Arjo introduced actually a very interesting tool, which was showing the, the match between the curious metallic range and the K-color range. I think these tools were really uh, interesting, but even within K-color, the combination of color is something uh, we could play with. So that's a discussion we, we have had with Robin already. Um, and um, well, it's a bit too early to, to share and, uh, all this. But, uh, uh, and, and by the way, I would like to, to thank uh, Ruben and his team for the, all the hard work he has done in the last, uh, last months to support us. And uh, we, we still have a long way to go, uh, and I'm sure we, we can count on them. 
Yeah, no, it's been really great working on this. And it's, uh, I think the, the, the point where we are now is very exciting. The fact that we can share with everyone all the work that has been done. But I think, like Xavier said, there's a lot in the pipeline, I think that's maybe and hopefully even more exciting. Yeah, I'm getting also sometimes the question, why it takes so long to do a, a brand transition? So people need to understand that, of course, there is a question of the, the, the product development itself, as again, we didn't want to take uh, up the shelf uh, ready to go products and just rebadge them with the, 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 with the former Arjo brands. Uh, but also you, you cannot imagine when you change uh, a logo, you need to uh, redesign the wrapper, uh, you need to produce a wrapper, which takes a minimal eight weeks. Uh, you need to redesign all the SKUs, uh, the whole assortment, uh, create the SKUs in the system, uh, making sure you agree on the service levels with the suppliers, that you, you have the right number of sheets on the pallets and so on. So many, many details. Um, so I, I don't want to go through all, all these uh, things which should be... Uh, not visible from the customer point of view, but uh, at least you, you can get a feel for what has been going on uh, behind the scene that kept us really busy. Uh, I'm not sure I would do this every year, to be frank, so that's why also we no. <laughs> put our eggs in the same basket. Please don't. <laughs> but uh, it's been very exciting. It's been really a learning uh, experience for all of us, uh, visiting all these means and very open communication with all uh, uh, all suppliers uh, was very enlightening. So uh, thank you to, to all. I know some of our suppliers are connected right now. I can see some names. So uh, thank you for your support during this uh, transition. And I'm glad at the end that we were able to uh, keep these uh, brands uh, alive. Uh, I know a lot of people are attached to these brands. So I'm sorry for the guys who are fanatic about Popset. Uh, we know some people will not like it, but well, it was a choice. And uh, in business, sometimes we have to make uh, uh, business decisions. And uh, that was one probably what we, we discussed most internally. But at the end, we, we thought it was the right decision to make. Okay. Yeah, and I also think that a lot of the decisions, and like Xavier said, some decisions come quite early on in the process and you sort of have to think into the future what that means and what that's going to develop into. But I think a lot of the choices and decisions that have been made have really been made with um, a strong eye on the people actually using it. So I think um, there has been some efficiencies, there have, have been some changes, but I think it's all been um, really thinking about these brands and these paper ranges and how to make them most future-proof and exciting for the users. I see one more question maybe I'd like to, to answer. No black color in Reeves. Um, it's not in the plan, to be honest, but uh, we never know. That could be an idea. Uh, what thing we're going to do is in K-Color, we will extend the, our range of black uh, black offer with a probably extra rough uh, finish uh, with higher grammage. So that's uh, something we, we have been asked to do. So we have a project on this one. Uh, in packaging, uh, I mentioned Delos, but we have some other ideas. We want to uh, announce uh, a full range in the coming months. Um, so yeah, um, a lot of exciting uh, possibilities. Okay, so, um, so thank you both for a great insight into the fantastic work that's been happening behind the scenes on all of these iconic brands. Um, very exciting times ahead. And I'm sure I speak for all attending. This has been a really helpful and very informative session. Um, thank you again for your time. And um, please don't forget to follow uh, Creative Papers by Ann Tallis on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram to see all the regular updates. So thank you um, to everybody and um, goodbye. Thank you very much and definitely uh... Following us on social media is probably the best way to make sure you don't miss a, a form to fill in to get sample packs. So uh, make sure you, you follow us. Thanks again. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.